I'd like to say welcome to everyone. And in uh, an attempt to be uh, timely, we, we thought we'd start on time. So I'll let everybody grab their seat that's coming in as uh, Leela's closing the back door. I am uh, Peter Saltonstall. I'm the president and CEO of Nord, and would like to welcome you to this briefing today. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank our staff for the hard work that they have uh, put into making this happen today. But also, I want to thank uh, Jay Eberly, who is Senator Barrasso's staff, and uh, Dr. Valerie Molason. Molason. Didn't know how to pronounce it and didn't want to butcher it. So thank from Senator Brown's office. And without their help, I must say uh, that and our staff, this, this briefing wouldn't be happening today. So thank you all um, very much for that. I thought that today, since some people in the room may not know a lot about rare diseases or about NORD, that I would give you a little bit of history about NORD because I thought that was important to put in context the rest of the conversation today. So I'm going to spend two minutes doing that. And for those of you in the room who know a lot about NORD, um, please uh, take a deep breath and just uh, bear with me for a few minutes. But NORD really is the voice of patients with rare diseases in this country. We've been around for 31 years, and it all started when um, a mom who had a child with uh, Tourette's syndrome, uh, who had, was getting a therapy, but uh, the therapy was going to end, and she couldn't get it any longer. So she went to the company to ask them why uh, they weren't going to provide the therapy anymore. And they said, the market's too small. We can't make money on it. Sorry. You're going to have to do something else. So she then, the mom, whose name was Abby Myers, then went to the FDA and pushed the FDA a little bit on the issue and said, who's going to take care of my kid? Who's going to provide a therapy for them? And so on. And the FDA basically put up their hands and said, sorry, we don't know. And so out of that, uh, Abby went home, mobilized uh, friends, other people that uh, she knew that had rare diseases. And out of that uh, came the Orphan Drug Act of 1983, signed January the 4th, 1983, by President Reagan. And Abby was, and the, the advocates were responsible for that. At the same time, the Nord organization was born simultaneously. And so I today am Abby's successor. I've been there for six years and am continuing to carry the, the patient torch in, um, in her behalf and on behalf of all patients with rare diseases in this country, which leads me to say that one in 10 of us sitting in this room or one in 10 in the American population now has a rare disease. So that's 30 million patients with rare diseases. So um, the word rare is kind of interesting when you think of 30 million people, but there are 30 million people with rare diseases right now. And so for us, it's a, it's a continued passion to make sure that uh, the Orphan Drug Act does the job that it intended to do. And uh, so we spend an awful lot of time watching that very carefully, advocating on behalf of it, listening to our member organizations, and then coming back and working on the Hill or wherever necessary to, to make sure that what its, an, an, its initial premise is, is carried through. So, and I think it's been a big success. I will say to you that right now there are 400 plus therapies for rare diseases for about 265 different diseases right now, but there's 7,000 rare diseases. And for those of you in the room who are not familiar with that, that there's, a, there's a fairly large delta, so we have a lot of things to do. And so Nord is the champion um, in the space. I don't want to take away from any of my members who are sitting in the room here who are disease specific, but Nord is the umbrella roll-up organization that works with all of those members to provide the consolidated voice um, on regulatory and policy issues and on other issues related to rare diseases. So with that, what I'd really like to do today is give us an opportunity to, to get into our program and uh, we put together, we've worked hard to put together a good program. We have Sandy Robinson, I know, is here from Avalier. We have members from our patient organizations, all that are going to speak. And then at the end of that, we wanted to try to make sure we allowed enough time to be able to have some meaningful questions from everybody in the room. So with that, I'll stop standing up here preaching about rare diseases, and I'll turn it over to Diane, I think, who's going to basically take it from here. So thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I, I want to extend my personal thanks to Jay um, uh, for everything that you have that you have done 
to to help us uh, move forward. I don't know if people are aware that um, that Senator Barrasso, along with Valerie's help in Senator Brown's office, introduced um, a resolution recognizing the um, issues related to uh, rare diseases and orphan product development, and also recognized NORD as a driving force in the rare disease community. So I would like to thank both of you very, very much. You have been strong supporters for a very long time. So thank you. So now I'd like to turn uh, the conversation over to Sandy Robinson. She is vice president um, and, and uh, it, at Avalier, she founded and leads the Avalier's patient access solutions practice to strategically advise the science companies and foundations on the design or redesign of comprehensive patient support programs based on marketplace dynamics and commercial objectives. And for the rare disease community, this is a very important topic because we, re we are reliant on so many critically important life-saving therapies and getting access to them can sometimes be a, rare a, a real challenge for the rare disease community. So welcome, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Peter and to Diane. And I actually uh, was asked to speak about 20 minutes today, but what I'd like to do is cut that short because we have such great perspectives that are coming from the patients. And I think it's important to hear their voice. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Affordable Care Act, or ACA. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about me, and that is that I have worked in the healthcare industry for 25 years. Um, I started on the payer side with a major Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, and where I got my bug for patients was working in the transplantation area, in organ transplantation, and immunosuppressive therapy, and uh, the fact that patients die without medications that are needed, and this is what started my passion. So to be here today and to talk to you about this really important issue is, is truly a, pl a pleasure of mine to be here. Um, I left the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan and I have spent over 20 years working in a variety of strategic advisory services firms, consulting firms, um, over the past 20 plus years. And uh, what I am passionate about is patient access to medication. So truly a privilege to be here. What I want to talk to you about is what everyone knows, and that is the Affordable Care Act um, and what that means. As you know, um, millions of Americans are now covered um, through insurance who previously did not have coverage through public or private um, means. And um, the, you've probably seen the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, estimates that just came out. At the end of February, 4.2 million people have been enrolled. Um, and the estimate as of the end of March is going to be 5.4 million. Um, and that is despite the many challenges that have occurred and everyone has seen it in the news um, and we all talk about it, uh, but there have been significant challenges in terms of enrollment. I do have some information that I thought would be um, important to share beyond just enrollment statistics. Avalier Health, as a strategic advisory firm, uh, is tracking the implementation of ACA, and this is something that is really in our sweet spot. So I do have some information around age demographics, et cetera, that I thought would be important to share here today. So in general, um, of those who have enrolled, um, it is about 50-50, with the cutoff being 45 years of age. So for those who are 45 and over, um, it's about 53%, and those who are 44 and younger. Um, and this is part of the concern around the ACA was that would we have the young healthies to come and enroll in the program, or would it be disproportional to, uh, to those who were older? So, so far, based on the statistics, that's what we have in terms of age demographics. In addition, um, I think what's really important is those who have gravitated towards which of the metal levels. 
And as you know, um, it's based on actuarial values, but they are metals, literally, um, bronze, silver, gold, and then platinum. And 63% of the enrollment has been in the silver plans. Um, not unusual, we did expect this because uh, the subsidies for premium assistance have gravitated towards the bronze and the silver plans. Um, just in case you want to know, for the bronze plan, the enrollment's been about 18%, gold 11%, and platinum 6%. I'm going to talk a little bit about the variance for rare disease patients and um, their out-of-pocket costs based on some studies that we've done as well. 83% um, on average of enrollees are receiving financial assistance for their premium costs. And the average deductible, which I thought was an interesting fact point to have for you today in the silver plans is a little over $2,500, so $2,567. Um, and as you know, most of the, what, what has been written um, for the maximum out-of-pocket cost is $6,350. So for a rare disease patient who's on a medication that costs $15,000 per month, uh, and has a 50% coinsurance out-of-pocket cost, they could very easily meet that out-of-pocket maximum very early on in the, in the calendar year. 63% um, of the plans are using coinsurance for their Tier 4 drugs. So just to level set, because I don't know what the, the understanding is, so copayment we associate with a flat dollar amount, and coinsurance is typically a percentage. And um, the fact that 63% of the plans are using coinsurance on the Tier 4, what does that practically mean for a patient? It means out-of-pocket cost is typically higher. And the higher the, the drug cost is, then the higher um, your out-of-pocket cost because your percent, it goes up proportionally with the percentage. Um, the most common copayment for a specialist visit um, in the silver plan starts at $41. Um, and there's been other issues, and I was speaking with a gentleman in the back of the room, Everett, about um, one of the really important issues that they're tracking, and that is access to providers. So you think about this from an insurance perspective, you predict what your um, premiums are going to be based on your actuarial value across your entire population. That may or may not take into account patients with special needs like rare disease patients. And so um, what we're hoping is that um, there's going to be adequate access for the rare disease medications. Um, but there's a huge issue in general in exchanges with access to providers. And that's something that's been um, of greatest concern to those um, you know, who have anyone who's, who's enrolling in the public exchanges. I mentioned that the websites were not working. Um, and they think that they have that fix. I was just at a conference two weeks ago and had some representatives from the states who are participating in the federally um, facilitated exchanges, and there's still a huge concern about the enrollment data moving from the websites over to those who are administering the plan. So I think that continues to be a challenge. Um, and then the other thing is the transparency of outpatient data, um, the formulary data. So um, who was here for the implementation of Medicare Part D? Um, and what we had when we started that, hi, Dina, I just saw you. Um, and so like what we need is plan finder for Medicare Part D. We need that for the exchanges, but it's not available yet. And hopefully it will be built um, in the meantime it's really going to be a struggle for patients to get the information that they truly need to make the educated decision about what public exchange to enroll in. Um, we've heard stories about individuals who have gone onto the websites and several clicks, 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 and you get a plan menu, and here's what you choose from, and the highest sensitivity for patients is around their premium cost. But it doesn't tell you anything about whether your specialists are in network. It doesn't tell you anything about whether your specific drug that you need is going to be covered by the formulary. And I think another real challenge is the fact that most of the formulary transparency has been around outpatient drugs that fall under the pharmacy benefit. 
There's been very little transparency around medical benefit drugs or those that are typically not self-administered. And that's really difficult information to get to get. So I think those are the ways in which we can improve moving forward. But those have been the challenges. So that's kind of in general and specific to um, rare disease patients. Um, Avalir has conducted a study um, which is an early examination of access to medication for rare disease patients. Um, it has been submitted for publication, so I'm bound by the guidelines of the publication to which it was submitted, but I wanted to give you a couple of top line um, you know, nuggets of what we've seen that I can share today. Um, I think you know, what we, the premise is that the ACA is going to open access for patients. And for me personally, working in this space for so long, um, my concern is that patients will move from uninsured to underinsured. And I think this is a concern that others share as well. Um, so our premise, our hypothesis was that we really wanted to do a preliminary examination based on the information that was available at the time, and this study was, condu was conducted last at the end of last year. Um, based on the formulary information that was available at the time. And we really took the patient's perspective, and that's why I've talked about the challenges with the websites and transparency of data and information. Um, and we also had someone from NORD that collaborated with us, which is um, Dr. Russ Teagarden. So he was a, a co-author on the paper. Um, but I think what's really unique for rare disease patients is that there's not a lot of treatment options available, as you know. and. Um, while we try to solve for that issue, um, for those drugs that are available in the marketplace to treat certain rare diseases, um, what does the early access look like within the ACA plans? So our analysis um, looked at not really insurance premium, but we focused on a couple of things. One was coverage, whether the drug was covered or not on the outpatient formulary. Um, we looked at utilization management, so were there any types of barriers that the, pa that the payer was using in terms of prior authorization or step therapy or quantity limits that would um, create um, a barrier to a patient from the patient's perspective? I mean, the perspective of the plan is they want the medication to go to the most appropriate patient. Um, if you're sitting from a patient's perspective and turn that around, it might mean additional time and effort to get to the, the needed medication. So, um, and we also looked at coinsurance. So what was the out-of-pocket cost based on coinsurance or copay? So we, we had a hypothesis going into this analysis, and that was if we look at the commercial insurance um, marketplace and we use that as a guide, um, what did we think would happen for the drugs? And there were um, 11 drugs that we looked at over seven disease states. And what we thought based on the commercial insurance market was, okay, these drugs are typically um, specialty drugs, considered that because of their cost and others, and so they will typically be on a higher tier. Um, we also um, felt that they would be subject to utilization management because of the fact that um, they're more expensive and often those, those go hand in hand. Um, and then finally, we thought that there would be uncertainty around the physician-administered drugs and the medical benefit just because um, it's, a harder, it's harder to find that information. And we felt like with all the challenges that were, occur were occurring with the ACA, um, that that information would be um, not as readily available. And so that was kind of our hypothesis going into the analysis. And so what we um, found was quite true um, to form, unfortunately. And um, in terms of coverage, what we found is a discrepancy between the bronze plans and the silver plan plans, and that was that the silver plans were more likely to cover the drugs that were in the analysis. Um, but the transparency of the information around drug coverage was really only available on the pharmacy benefit side. There was very little information on a medical benefit drug physician administered. Um, the selected medications that we had in our analysis were most likely to appear on the highest tiers um, and most likely in the four-tier formularies or not at all. 
and that was a real concern that we, that we found in terms of um, patients who needed access to the medication. And then more than 70% of the plans in the study used coinsurance. That made sense to us, kind of you know common sense test, right? Because it's a higher specialty tier. Um, but the rates of coinsurance were really um, vast in terms of the differences. So for the bronze plans, it was anywhere from 15 to 50%. And for the silver plans, the coinsurance ranged from 10% to 50%. So the example that I already used, you can you can see where a patient very you know very early in the benefit year is going to spend through, um, and have to have you know influx of that out of pocket cost, um, perhaps on the first or second you know medication fill, um, and. For those that did utilize copayments, the range that we found in our analysis was $20 to $250 um, per prescription, and that was across both silver and bronze plans. So um, I think what we found is, is not um, unsurprising, um, but the analysis did show that you know, we have some work to do in terms of access to data that can help patients make those educated decisions that they need to have a full picture um, of what is going to be their, their cost from a premium perspective, um, from an out-of-pocket cost, coinsurance or, uh, or copay. And um, you know, what we know is that there's more work to be done. And we actually hope to make this a, a series of articles so that we can track this um, as we progress, as you know, we're in the inaugural year right now of the ACA, um, and so these issues are top of mind, but as we move into the second plan year next year, we would love to, to continue to, to study this, and thank you so much for the collaboration, Diane and Peter, that we have with NORD and uh, the ability to, to make a difference in patient lives, so thank you so much. It's, it's not published yet, right? Sandy, do you have any idea when that might be available? And would we be able to share that with the people that are in this room? It's, uh, it is in peer review right now. Okay. And so uh, based on that review process, four weeks at the earliest. And I would imagine since Russ is a, uh, a co-author that you know, you'll have the ability to put that up on the board site as well. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so very much. So I, I, I'm sure you can now kind of understand that there are real challenges within the rare disease community. Um, for some patients with rare diseases, it can take up to seven years just to reach a diagnosis. So they're forced to go from doctor to specialist to snake oil salesman to another specialist. So access to um, specialists, I think, is going to be a really important issue for the rare disease community, as well as the specialty tiers, because we do know that because so many of these products are so expensive, um, that even though they may reach that threshold where um, very, very quickly the 6000 and some dollars, there are going to be some families, some patients who are simply not going to be able to even afford, you know, afford that, uh, that co-insurance cost. So we continue to be very, very concerned. And some of our focuses right now within NORD is, is focusing on uh, the state uh, the state level, so that's where a lot of our focus is going to continue to be. So we're developing resources for our rare disease community. So at this point, so they at least know where to go. Who is the insurance ombudsman? Who is, you know, who is the insurance commissioner? What is the appeals process? So if you look at our website, we're now doing that right now, and we'll be building on that because we understand that the patients across the country are going to have a lot of challenges that hopefully we can help with. So right now, I'd like to invite our patient community panel to, uh, to the front. Um, they are the heart and soul of NORD. That's why NORD exists, um, because we are concerned the patients have access to um, specialists, yes, and have access to appropriate health care, as well as to um, therapies, um, since there are so few therapies that treat so few rare diseases. As, as Peter mentioned, there are just, um, I think, 
just over 400 orphan products that are on the market today, but they treat only about 250 rare diseases. So the delta between those patients that have an actual therapy, a life-saving therapy, and those that do not is a real challenge for the patient community. So we also want to focus on encouraging the development of orphan products, medical foods for inborn errors of metabolism, and also humanitarian use devices. So we're not just focused on on uh, biopharmaceuticals, but across the spectrum to ensure that all the patients with rare diseases have the therapy and have the care that they need. So, Stephanie, would you want to come up too? The people sitting here today are why Nord exists today for the patients and their families. So I want to thank all three of you for being here. So I'm going to introduce each speaker individually. They all have a different story to tell, a very important story to tell that I don't I think a lot of people have heard. So first I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Richard Zine. He is president and chief executive officer of the Foundation for PSP and Related Brain Diseases. Um, and he has been um, in the nonprofit executive management and charitable work for over 40 years. And I will introduce each person individually as we go forward. So, Richard, um, did you want to stand at the podium or did you yeah. want to sit? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'd like to thank Peter and Diane and Nord for providing uh, this opportunity to present the challenges of people with rare neurodegenerative brain disorders. When I think of our patients and care partners on a changing healthcare landscape, I think of a Salvador Dali painting. On the canvas are a few small people under a hot sun and a melting clock representing the swift disappearance of time. But our foundation, Cure PSP, is all about hope and helping people in the present moment in their struggle with brain disease. Cure PSP's vision is a world free of PSP, CBD, and related brain diseases. Since 1990, the foundation has been working to treat, prevent, or even cure the scourge of neurodegenerative brain disease. Scientists predict that research into the causes of such rare diseases as progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, and multiple system atrophy may lead to treatments or therapies for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. In the United States, 12 new patients are diagnosed with PSP every day. For each person with a diagnosis of PSP, three others remain undiagnosed. Approximately 30,000 people in the United States in total have PSP, CBD, or MSA. Currently, there are no known causes for PSP, CBD, or MSA, and there are no treatments to address disease etiology. Some neurodegenerative conditions have clear genetic causes, while others involve complex interactions of genetics and environmental influences that affect the brain in many different ways. In PSP, CBD, and MSA, profound disability and eventual death are the result of loss of movement, vision, speech, and swallowing accompanied by impairments in thinking, decision-making, and behavior. <clears throat> the average patient with PSP, or CBD, first notices symptoms in the early 60s and may survive seven years. MSA typically starts in the mid-50s with similar rapid and tragic disease course. Most of those years of illness are spent in extreme disability requiring spouses, family or care partners to devote enormous amounts of time, expense, and emotional energy to care for their loved ones. One might ask why it is so important to cure these terrible, rare disorders affecting such a relatively small population. 
Beyond the basic human response to alleviate the terrible suffering of these people, the reason is that scientists have discovered that the basic processes underlying these disorders are shared by other more common neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. All have at their core a malfunctioning or misfolding of essential proteins. One of these proteins is the tau protein, which affects various parts of the brain in various disorders. Finding a cure for PSP, CBD, or MSA through research and smaller, shorter clinical trials may open the floodgates to new therapies for the major degenerative disorders. It is essential that our leaders in government direct funding toward this group of rare brain disorders to facilitate and expedite therapies which may lead to wider cures. If we don't focus our attention now on these disorders, the costs will be unavoidable, astronomical, and economically disastrous. Care for, rel uh, for the relatively small group of patients with PSP, CBD, and MSA in the United States is estimated to be $3 billion per year, while the cost for Alzheimer's disease alone is $200 billion. On a combined basis, degenerative brain diseases in the United States will cost $20 trillion over the next 40 years. Since the inception of its global research program in 1997, Cure PSP has funded 150 research grants, but we've just scratched the surface in our understanding of the genetics and the molecular biology of these disorders. We've completed a whole genome analysis, and we've discovered implicating genes. But this has only opened the doors to new inquiry, which must be done on a larger basis. Our new research roadmap is a $15 million project to explore these genes and related proteins, as well as to develop new models, methodologies, and drugs to get at root causes. The NIH must commit more funds for the cure and prevention of these diseases now, or we will all face the cons consequences of being a highly debilitated nation with an impossibly high bill to pay for the care of these very sick citizens, which may include some of us here in this room. While Cure PSP's primary focus is to cure disease, we spend a lot of time and resources caring for those who are suffering and also for their care partners who devote their lives to providing support. Quality of life issues are paramount, but we often find that our patients are falling through the cracks. Not a day goes by that we don't hear from a care partner or support group leader about the crisis in our Medicare system and how it ignores the urgency associated with these rare forms of neurodegeneration. Why, for example, does Medicare pick and choose among rare brain disorders? They recognize ALS but ignore other progressive degenerative diseases that are equally devastating. Our care partners have experienced firsthand the emotional and financial burdens of these diseases. It may take younger patients two years to receive Medicare, and by that time, many patients have died or have become severely disabled. Congress waived the 24-month waiting period for patients with ALS, but patients with PSP, CBD, and MSA still have to abide by an arbitrary and unfair waiting period. People with PSP, CBD, and MSA cannot work. There are no drugs or therapies to target the root causes of these diseases. There are also very limited therapies to ameliorate or manage symptoms. Medicare puts caps on the only treatments that will help sustain quality of life while these diseases continue to destroy brain and bodily function. 
therapy, hospice, and palliative care are the only answers. Our patients are mostly of Medicare age, but cannot get coverage for palliative hospice care because of outdated parameters or regulations. Such regulations say that therapy services must be provided with the expectation that the condition of the patient will improve materially in a reasonable and predictable period of time. Sadly, patients with PSP, CBD, or MSA do not have restorative potential, but they should not be denied the services that would improve the quality of their daily lives. In 2011, after a multi-year effort by CurePSP, the Social Security Administration approved patients with PSP, CBD, and MSA to receive compassionate allowances. The Compassionate Allowances Program fast tracks disability decisions to ensure that citizens with the most serious disabilities receive their benefit decisions within days instead of months or years. We are asking that Medicare also recognize with equality and fairness the rare devastating neurodegenerative brain disorders that affect the elderly so that they may also have a suitable quality of life. And it's just not Medicare, of course. Hospice services are often not discussed at all with patients and families. Hospice referrals are often made when patients are in the last weeks or days of life. Admission criteria to hospice are variable, and many facilities are not even familiar with rare brain disorders, which may inhibit or prolong their admission. Hospice length of service reviews may unfairly judge patients with these disorders because they may be perceived as uh, being stable and thus ineligible for continued care. Yet because of their disease, they are on a precipitous and progressive decline. CurePSP is helping to educate medical professionals and healthcare providers in the best types of therapies and services for patients with PSP, CBD, or MSA, and is on the front line of this activity working with PTs, OTs, therapists, nurses, and social workers. Neurologists and primary care physicians are often not aware of the benefit patients can receive by participation in physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, and may not make referrals. Neurologists are also less likely to see patients frequently, especially as the disease progresses. So the likelihood of recognizing a patient's level of functioning may actually decrease. 20 years ago, very few patients with rare brain disorders were even recognized or acknowledged on this very surreal landscape. Today, because of the work of CurePSP and other patient advocacy organizations such as NORD, there is an awareness and burgeoning concern of the need for more research to cure these disorders and quality of life services for those who are struggling every day. Thank you very much. Richard, thank you so very, very much. I, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but my father died of a very rare brain disorder. So the great work that you're doing is very, very much appreciated. And I think that's a message that the rare disease community has not been able to get across to a lot of people who don't understand why are we doing research into rare diseases? Why are we developing products for these for very small patient populations? And I think the NIH has said it probably best, you know, that understanding the pathogenesis of rare diseases is going to increase the medical community's understanding of diseases that affect far wider populations. And I think you really got that message across, Richard. Thank you very much. So now I'd like uh, to introduce Stephanie Bozarth. Um, I had an opportunity to meet her and her lovely family a couple of months ago at an FDA advisory committee meeting. Stephanie is a vice president and chair of federal legislative, uh, on the legislative committee for the National MPS Society, and is a parent of a child diagnosed with a rare degenerative disease called Morchio A. Stephanie and her husband, Austin, who's here today, thank you, Austin, um, reside in Alexandria. 
and uh, with their three young children. And seven-year-old Annabelle was diagnosed with Morchio A. And, and there's five-year-old Madeline and two-year-old Charlotte. And you can see her lovely daughter right there on, uh, on the screen. So with that, Stephanie, please. Hi. Um, I actually, it's so funny that, or it's not funny, but um, yesterday I actually got some information from our insurance provider that's, that's really made me change up what I was going to say a little bit. So I've had a few changes. I'm going to be flipping around a little bit, but I do want to share with you a very personal story to me and, and my family. Um, as you can see, my daughter, and there's also, I brought another picture of her too. We're very proud of her. She's seven years old to, um, now, about to be eight in May. And about seven years ago, um, she is our firstborn. About seven years ago, um, I took her to her well checkup when she was about four months old, and I pointed out to the pediatrician that something didn't feel right on her spine. It, it was just bothersome, and I, I wanted her to feel it and look at it. She did, and she gave me um, a referral to go get x-rays immediately, which I did. The next day, I was up at Children's National Medical Center getting those x-rays. And uh, as I was about to leave and gather her up and go home, the radiologist came out with her fellow. And usually when you get x-rays, you only see the text. So when the radiologist came out, she said, I just want to see your daughter. Can I just look at her? And I'd like my fellow to see her too. And I thought, this is not good. And she wouldn't tell me really what was going on, but she said, you know, don't, don't worry. Just go home, and your pediatrician will follow up with you. So I did. I drove home kind of in that state of shock, of scared. You know, you know something is going to happen. You know it's bad, but you don't know what it is yet. I, as I pulled up and w went, went into the house, the phone was already ringing, and it was our pediatrician on the phone. She had already set up an appointment with our genetics clinic and wanted to make sure that both my husband and I could show up for that appointment and bring our daughter with us. And she chatted and, and tried to talk to me a little bit about what they had seen on the x-rays and, um, and, and said a word called mucopolysaccharidosis. And I said, can you please spell that for me? She said, no, no, please. Don't look this up. Don't spell it out. Don't worry. Just go to your geneticist for right now. Let's, let's not go that path until we know more. And I said, no, I'm going to write it down. I, I want to look. And actually, I am formerly a social worker, and I knew to go to Nord's website that I knew I could get some good information there about mucopolysaccharosis. And what I found, that it was a rare terminal disease the average lifespan is 14 years old. It affects the entire body. Healthy babies look beautiful at birth, but slowly over time, the disease affects every part of their body. At the, and I also found out that there were 11 types of MPS, um, three of which did have treatments. However, the rest of them had no treatments and, and of course, no cures. Uh, we did go to see the geneticist, um, and after a couple of months, which was fairly unusual, by six months old, we did have it confirmed that she had MPS4. It turned out to be one of those MPSs that didn't have a treatment. So my husband and I, um, we spent a lot of time in those first few months calling everywhere. We called other countries. We called geneticists. We traveled up and down the East Corridor. Uh, we went to doctors everywhere, trying to get more answers, more information. What type of research is happening about Morikyo? Certainly somebody somewhere knows something. But what we kept finding was it was pretty much a desert. I mean, there was just not that much going on with Morikyo research. Um, so in the meantime, we, we did um, start doing a lot of things to start raising funds for Morikyo research. Um, however, Annabelle's disease is continuing to progress. She had, at two years old, a spinal decompression infusion where she was in a halo for three months. At four years old, she had her have her hips fully reconstructed. She started out with hips, but because of the disease, those slowly disintegrated and had to be reconstructed. She's had knee plates, ankle surgeries. She's had hearing loss, corneal clouding. She has valve leaking. She is probably not going to grow taller than three and a half feet, which is pretty small, and you can't really reach even the faucets of a public bathroom. 
She has severe bone deformities throughout her body. However, my husband and I, we have continued to stay hopeful. And um, between us and a lot of our family members and a lot of volunteers, we've raised over $200,000 that we have put towards peer-reviewed Morkio research grants. And then we found the MPS Society, which was a huge success. Um, for many rare diseases, they, it is great to find an organization that you can be a part of and latch onto and join together to do things such as legislative advocacy and better understand what are the regulations out there that are slowing the process. What is going on with raising money and where can we find researchers and where can we find more researchers out there to invest in looking into diseases such as MPS and Morkio. Um, once I found the MPS Society, I decided I should join the board of directors, and then I became the vice president, and then I decided to become the chair of the legislative committee um, because it's so important to me. Um, the MPS Society does exist to provide grants um, for research and support for families. It's uh, been in existence for 40 years. This year is our 40th year celebration. And since 2001, we have raised $5 million towards research grants. It is organizations like this one that really help to seed money out there to researchers that can later on go into clinical trials and hopefully eventually those turn into treatments. I have um, one of the challenges uh, with rare disease and research and drug development is the small patient populations, the progressiveness of the disease, the heterogeneity of the disease, which means my daughter that has Morkio may look kind of pretty different, and the symptoms may show up very differently from a child her same age with Morkio. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the disease. So that is just another challenge with trying to find treatments and prove that treatments are working. Um, but I'm proud to say that we actually got there. Um, on February 14, 2014, there was a drug approved to treat Morkio syndrome. It's an enzyme replacement therapy that helps replace the enzyme that her body is missing. Um, Annabelle was in this study for two and a half years, and we have seen dramatic improvement. It was the child um, at four years old sitting on the park bench next to me with tears in her eyes because she couldn't keep up with the rest of the kids, and she just wanted to go home because it was embarrassing. To now the kid, as you can see in these pictures, that is smiling, she is vibrant, she is being a kid, she is in second grade, and she's doing everything a second grader needs to do and having friends and socializing. That is what treatment gave us. It is huge. Um, but we didn't get there alone. It took a lot of partners together to streamline this path to success. That is, along with the MPS Society and organizations like that, we went out and educated the patient, patient um, group about this clinical trial that was happening. I was posting on social media and calling and emailing everyone I knew. Um, the FDA participated in a, a great deal when it became the time to actually approve the drug. They had a listening call, is what they called it, where they had me, along with several other patients and family caregivers, talk about what Morkio is and what it means to us so that the regulators that are reviewing this drug would better understand what is important when looking for a treatment for this disease. They also even hired a patient caregiver um, to, to represent our disease on the advisory committee panel, which we did have back in November, and where they reviewed everything about this drug and if it was actually a working treatment. Um, that was so exciting to see that the FDA was listening to our patient, or our patient group and, and taking that information back to then make a decision about if they should approve that treatment or not. It's also like this, another part that has been a huge piece in getting us to this success was legislative incentives that y'all may have been a part of um, putting, getting out there, such as the Orphan Drug Tax Credit. In 1983, it is a mechanism that, that was developed to incentivize the development of medications and treatments that have entered for, for, sorry, for rare diseases for industry. Since 1983, more than 3,000 potential treatments have entered the research pipeline as orphan drugs. 
The decade prior to the orphan drug tax credit, about 10 drugs entered that pipeline. It's clearly there, there was success with that incentive. Despite this progress, there are approximately 7,000 rare diseases, which you've already heard several times, affecting 30 million people. Most of those have no cures and treatments, so our work is not done, and things such as the orphan drug tax credit must be protected. We also just experienced, experienced the implementation of one of the most recent initiatives, the pediatric voucher incentive that was introduced in 2012 FIDESIA when it was passed. It is one of the incentives the FDA uses to encourage companies to develop therapies for children who suffer from rare diseases. Upon approval of Vimazim for the treatment of Morkio, the sponsor was granted seven years of marketing exclusivity and was also awarded the first ever rare pediatric disease priority review voucher. This voucher is an incentive to encourage the development of new drugs and biologics for the prevention and treatment of rare pediatric diseases like Vimazim, which is the drug my daughter is getting. In order for a rare pediatric disease classification, it must primarily affect individuals from birth to 18 years old. The sponsor can then use this voucher to re reduce the FDA review time for one of their future marketing applications from 12 months to eight months. Alternatively, they can sell those to another company. While often drugs are reviewed with the same standards and safety and effectiveness as other drugs, the FDA acknowledges the special challenges of developing treatments for very small patient populations. And incentives like these are required to encourage innovators to take a risk to develop treatments for very small patient populations with addressing these unique challenges that I've already told you about. In sum, much has been accomplished by the FDA, by NIH, by the medical and scientific researchers, by pharmaceutical industry, by the financial community, and by patient advocates in these first 30 years since the orphan drug tax credit, but there is much, much more to be done. Um, and as I talked about just a little earlier, one of the other concerns is with out-of-network classifications, in which we've brought up a couple of times already. As the Affordable Care Act is implemented, it is essential that patients with rare diseases aren't hurt by this out-of-network classifications. Provider networks must be broad enough that patients can afford to see the specialists that they need without exorbitant co-pays and, and deductibles. Patients with MPS, like my daughter, we require to go more than just to doctors right here in our area. Um, we travel back and forth to go to a hospital um, further up the East Coast where we can get the specialized care. Annabelle's already had seven surgeries there to maintain the ability to walk. And in the lifetime of a child with Morkio, usually there's about 30 to 40 surgeries. So we imagine we've got a few more in our future. An example of the importance of keeping these networks broad is one that we are just now experiencing. We have a private health care insurer, and we have, for the last several years, been using them to go to all of those providers that we needed, and they were in network. But just recently, our health care insurer has decided to make their network smaller so that they can cover cost or whatever it is that they want. I, of course, was not a part of that negotiation, but it knocked out a very important specialist that we see every six months. This is critically concerning that this ripple effect of making sure that these rare disease patients that are able to see those broad out of, you know, spectrum of providers along with, as, as was mentioned before, the medicines that they need to receive. I didn't really have a conclusion to this, but that is my story, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you so much. And uh, if everyone in the audience hasn't figured out already, the patient community, their moms and dads, brothers and sisters, organizations like MPS Society, they're the ones who drive the research. They're the ones who have the bake sales and the bolathons just to raise enough money to interest someone within the research community 
to maybe do a little bit of research. So um, I thank you very much for everything that you, you are one of the movers and drivers of the rare disease community. Thank you very much. So with that, I'd like to now introduce uh, Chuck Mohan. He is CEO and Executive Director of the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Um, he founded the uh, UMDF in the basement of his home in 1996, which is pretty typical of the rare disease community. So, so many of our patient organizations are very, very small, and yes, they do operate out of their kitchen, their kitchen tables or in their basements. So with that, I'd like to introduce Chuck. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Diane. Uh, you know, my dad always told me, you never want to be the first speaker before 9 o'clock in the morning, and you never want to be the last one after 3 o'clock. <laughs> Four minutes to 3. So I'm going to talk real fast. But I, you know, I want to thank Peter and, and Nord for the opportunity to come back to Washington, D.C. and speak a little bit about something that is, that is sorely understood, but certainly in need of understanding, and that's rare diseases in its aggregate. Um, Nord certainly provides the umbrella for all of these independent rare disease communities to huddle under. And, um, and, and we thank Peter and his team for, for allowing us to come here today. So Sandy, I want to mention something. I was very interested in, in, in what you had to say because, um, and, and I, I certainly want to chat with you a little bit later about some of these issues that we're having with folks calling us about the Affordable Health Care Act. Not only about going out of network, but we have many that are going out of state. So it's like a double whammy because they're not being covered and there are all kind of complicated issues, not only out of network, but out of state as well. And so, you, you, you know, it's, uh, Diane, you had said something earlier about the length of time. Many of these people take three and four and five years to get a diagnosis. I am an ex-school teacher and I got into the uh, family restaurant business. So I quit teaching, was, in, was building a restaurant. Went from uh, 1,400 square feet to 7,000 square feet. Working my average 80 to 90 hours a week, my wife called me up and said, you better get home, our daughter is sick. Came home, went through all the hoops and all the, the hurdles and journeys that we all go, go through just to be told that uh, your daughter has me loss. I have a working diagnosis of me loss. Now, how many people know somebody or have heard of cancer? Just raise your hand real quick. I know everybody in the room has. Uh, how many of you have heard of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's? Raise now, how many of you know somebody or are familiar with me loss? One person. Do you know what it stands for? Oh, well, then you don't count. <laughs> so I asked the question, what does me loss stand for? And my doctor, like yours, says, you don't have to worry about it. Don't worry. You know, just go home and pretend everything will be fine, and we'll be in touch with you. It stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like syndrome. Rolls right off your tongue. Average life expectancy, late childhood, early adulthood. Our daughter was 14. Clinical working diagnosis at 14 with that future facing us. I did not go back to the restaurant business. <laughs> I went to my basement. And we started working and started diligently looking like all of us do. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. We started not like, unlike every other patient advocacy group in the world. We built a beginning with 85 families across the United States. Today we have 60,000. We started with two employees, me and my wife, who worked very cheap. We now have 20. We have 85 groups across the United States. We were helped and formed an international mitochondrial disease community housed in Europe that now consists of 12 countries. We're casting a large as net as possible over what is perceived to be a small community because there is, there is, there is benefit to critical mass. And that's what we have to build, critical mass, not among the individual rare diseases, but among the, but among the rare disease community. And I think this, through Nord, pre presents just a phenomenal opportunity to do that. So like I said, the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation is, a, is a, the result of a number of smaller groups that saw the value in uniting, not being disease specific, because if I went out 
And I came to DC and I talked about the, the mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis and stroke-like foundation. I would be talking about maybe one in 50,000, one in 200,000. It doesn't work that way. The first time I came to Washington, DC was the Seattle inspector, my senior senator. And at that time, I think he was a Democrat. The next time I came to see him, I think he was a Republican. I'm not sure. It was very, very difficult to keep track of him. But yet, you know, when I got to talk to him, that's exactly what he would say is, what's the prevalence? They wanted to know numbers. And when I told him what the prevalence was, he immediately referred me to his legislative assistant because they weren't really significant in his area of interest. But collectively, when we're talking about 30 million Americans living with a rare disease in the United States, when we're talking about 30 million Europeans living with a rare disease, when we're talking about globally 350 million people, those are not small numbers. That is an aggregate that needs to be addressed. That is a number that needs to be looked at with a paradigm shift not on the common, what I call sexy diseases, but on the unique diseases that could have surrogate endpoints that could be extremely meaningful in solving the mystery and the solution to some of these other sexy diseases. By looking at the microcosm, we can better address the macrocosm. So mitochondrial disease is a multi-system disease. Um, and I tell Peter, we are the Nord of mitochondrial disease. We now have identified over 250 individual identified mitochondrial diseases. So, you know, I was going and starting in a basement looking for a mitochondrial disease. We now have 250 of them. We're told it's very systemic. We're told that now, because of various uh, technological advances in research, the least of which is exome sequencing, that mitochondrial function and dysfunction plays an extremely important part in in life, in the aging process, in the ability of the body to produce energy. It is and impacts the body to produce energy to support life. So what organ or what disease isn't relying on energy? So we have a lot of work ahead of us. We just have to define and track and strategically plan very carefully how we're going to approach every disease that's associated with errors of energy metabolism. When I'm in the elevator, you give that three-second elevator speech, somebody will see my tag and say, my God, mitochondrial disease, I think I heard that. Isn't that the powerhouse of the cell? Ninth grade biology. And then they'll say, what does it do? And I say, well, it does everything from constipation to flat tires. And that gets their attention. And then we talk a little bit about constipation because we know it doesn't, at this point, it has, at least hasn't been proven to affect and have an impact on flat tires. So as I said, it's not a single disease. Over 250 of them have already been identified. What we need to do is to look collectively at the rare disease community in a shift in paradigm thinking. Many rare diseases suffer mostly because of the perceived low prevalence. From lack of interest, education, experience, and understanding by the medical and allied health communities, because of imposed time restraints, because of limited education and abilities, involved and complex patient familiar histories that need to be taken to see the hereditary factor and the progression of disease. It's hard to, it's hard to track the progression of a disease when some of the patients don't live long. Very, very difficult. We searched four years traveling the country. I saw 22 professionals in Pennsylvania, saw 45 total traveling from, Pens from Pittsburgh to UCLA, to UC uh, UCSD uh, Clinical Research and, and Metabolic Center to get a PET scan. And I, I remember telling the doctor, I said, wait a minute, they're just installing a PET scan in Pittsburgh. Why do I have to go to California? They said, because the PET scan is only as good as the person that can interpret it. All right, so I let that one go and got a plane ticket and went to California. After seeing 45 specialists, that's when we had our clinical working diagnosis and we lost our battle. My daughter died eight months later. And you were talking about the length of the time for a diagnosis. All right, that was in 1995. Four months ago, I sent the last tissue sample I had to a researcher at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to see if I can get a scientific diagnosis 18 years later. So we're still working. We're still working on that clinical diagnosis. So you know, I think there's an increased need for patient advocacy in a rare disease community in a changing healthcare environment. 
Uh, we've heard nothing but changes. And sometimes we really have to get involved to really actually understand what the changes are. So this, this increase in patient advocacy um, is very interesting. As Peter, I think, it alluded to, the, according to, to Nord, you're telling me that 95% of rare diseases do not have one single FDA-approved drug for treatment. Now, during the first 25 years, as, as you heard, of the, of the Orphan Drug Act that was passed in 1983, only 326 new drugs were approved by the FDA and brought to market for rare disease patients combined. Now, here's an interesting fact. The discovery moment in the laboratory produces 1,000 newly identified compounds that will be narrowed down to 100 because of preclinical investigations. Out of that 100, in three to six more years, because of clinical trials, that's going to be narrowed down to about 10. And in, six, in another three to four years, or two to three years, because of FDA review, those 10 will be narrowed down to one. So what we have is a model. And I'm not insinuating that the process is not good. But we have a model that takes a, a eureka of 1,000 molecules, and in 10 to 15 years, and at a cost of $800 million to $1.2 billion comes up with one produced drug, is not meeting the needs of the rare disease community. That's the need for the paradigm shift. It's not that it's wrong. It just has to be a lot gooder. You know, rare disease by their nature are complex medical issues, and complex medical issues demand a more focused and coordinated team approach. So this is very important because we're, as an organization, are facing this almost on a daily basis now. The approach has to go behind and beyond standard treatments. It starts with a grassroots level with caregivers being forced to search out doctors who have the interest and willingness to dedicate the time to understand the degree, the disease, and then have the ability to offer treatments. Many rare disease issues and necessary caregiver involvement by their nature raises the suspicion of Munchausen, Munchausen by proxy, and medical child abuse. Most caregivers must coordinate their own treatment between specialists who may, as we heard, be not only in different hospitals, but in different cities and in different states. This is not doctor shopping. This is necessary proactive advocacy behavior. Many caregivers must provide emergency room physicians with patient history and recommendations of, of treatment courses that are effective and necessary. This is not demanding treatments in an emergency room atmosphere, this is necessary proactive educational advocacy behavior. Many diagnostic labs have differing methodologies and matrices. Doesn't mean that they're right and doesn't mean that lab B is wrong. It means there's a dire need for standardization among diagnostic labs, especially in a rare disease community. We have to have a fundamental baseline. We've got to raise it up the flagpole and see how many people salute. And when those are not saluting, we restructure, we retool, and we raise it up again. There has to be an impact of standards within that diagnostic community. You know, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the, you know, treating the inherent inconsistencies associated with rare diseases differently than we do with more common diseases. You know, we have to bring all of these providers together before we jump the bandwagon and make unilateral decisions on drastically changing a patient's treatment course. Whenever we have these complex medical issues, we don't have to agree on a diagnosis to prohibit treatment. We need to treat the symptoms that are occurring immediately and worry about the diagnosis later. But we certainly have to coordinate the team of providers before we go to the accusers. And that is a symptom of rare diseases. You know, in conclusion, I, 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 many of you probably know Dr. Bill Gall. Dr. Gall is a director of the National Human Genome Research Institute who leads the NIH's Undiagnosed Disease Program. Now, Dr. Gall said, quote, what occurs 
less than one-tenth of percent of one percent of the population, yet is found in one form or another in almost every family in the world? Don't answer, because you know. It's a rare genetic disease. So what is found in one form or another in almost every family in the world? A rare genetic disease. He goes on to say that the study of rare genetic diseases is very important. Rare diseases usually occur when two people who don't know one another that carry a mutation and marry and have children. There's no practical way to find out who has such mutations beforehand. People with rare genetic diseases are often overlooked or forgotten. But we gain a great deal from studying their disorders. Bill Gall says, their contributions to medical science are pure gold. Dr. Edmund Wilson, and I don't know how many of you might know Dr. Edmund Wilson, but in his book titled, The Cell in Development and Heredity, says, long ago it became evident that the key to every biological problem must finally be sought in the cell. For every living organism is, or at some time has been, a cell. Kind of makes sense to me. You really, really got to the common denominator there. What's interesting is Dr. Wilson was an American cytologist, an early advocate of the chromosomal theory of inheritance, and a professor at Columbia University. Now, he, What's interesting, too, he was born in 1856. He died in 1939. And the book that I quoted from is the third edition, written in 1925. Sometimes it takes us a long time to get to the root of rare diseases and etiologies. Ladies and gentlemen, rare diseases in a changing healthcare landscape must be given a higher research and treatment priority. If all the people with rare diseases lived in one country, it would be the world's third most populous country. Gaining a better understanding of rare diseases will be key in finding cures for many of the sexy diseases. Peter, thank you very much. Well, folks, if you haven't figured it out by now, passion does drive the rare disease community. And Chuck, in your next life, might I suggest you come back as a preacher, because I'm a convert. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I really am. Amen. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Andrew Emmett, uh, someone I've had the, the pleasure of working with for, for many, many years. And when we talk about the rare disease community, I'm not just talking about some of the folks sitting here right now. I'm talking about researchers. I'm talking about government agencies. I'm talking about the industry as well, because without the industry and the incentives that they have to develop these cutting edge products, we wouldn't be sitting here today. So I would like to introduce Andrew Emmett. He is the Managing Director for Science and Regulatory Affairs at the Biotechnology Industry Organization, or I fondly call it BIO. And he develops and implements strategic bioresponses to scientific and regulatory issues that affect the ability of BIO's human healthcare focused companies to research and develop new medicines and biotechnology therapies. Thank you. And welcome. Thank you, Diane, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Peter and Nord for putting on this briefing. And first, can I say, Wow, what a privilege it is to speak after a panel of such tremendous and passionate uh, patient advocates and, and caregivers. Um, it really is, is true that this is a partnership in developing new therapies for rare diseases, and the patient voice is just so critically important in, in that, in that we really need to rally together as the, uh, as the government and the private sector, academia, and patients towards this common goal of uh, rare disease drug development. Um, I was asked today to say a few words about the uh, uh, biotechnology industry and our commitment to, uh, of uh, the scientists and researchers uh, in our companies to uh, developing new rare disease therapies. Um, in particular, some of the promises and challenges of rare disease drug development, uh, and also the interplay between the investment and economic climate and the regulatory environment and how they help us to drive towards R&D in uh, rare disease drug development. Um, first, about bio and the biotech industry. Uh, we represent about 1,000 biotech companies, uh, academic institutions, state biotechnology uh, uh, 
uh, centers in all uh, 30, uh, 30 uh, all 50 states and 30 other nations. And our driving mission is to bring hope and to meet the needs of the patients who suffer from any of the rare conditions that we've uh, discussed today. Um, in fact, about 90% of uh, BIOS membership are uh, small and mid-sized uh, emerging biotechnology companies who are really focused on uh, the navigating the decades-long and costly uh, uh, road from discovery to clinical development to FDA uh, approval. And our challenge is to identifying the scientific approaches and the public policies that can help further facilitate and eventually accelerate uh, the development of the next generation of uh, orphan products. And we work very closely with, uh, with NORD and the uh, rare disease uh, patient advocacy uh, uh, community to meet those, uh, those goals. So first, what are some of the challenges and opportunities we, uh, we face? I think we heard before that this is an area of considerable unmet medical need. Uh, as uh, was noted, more than 7,000 uh, rare disease affecting 30 million Americans. And the challenges in researching that is, uh, one, the high degree of variability and heterogeneity that we see in rare diseases. The challenges around the underlying basic and translational sciences of understanding the progression and the molecular etiology of these, uh, these conditions. Um, patient enrollment of these small patient populations can be a, a, a challenge, and sometimes in such state non-traditional and global development programs. And we need to focus on cutting edge and non-traditional study designs and statistical approaches as part of rare disease drug development. For, bio, for the biotechnology industry and our companies that are committed to rare disease drug development, it's a very high risk endeavor. And uh, there's very little precedence in many of these diseases about how you would conduct these research programs. Um, many of these uh, approaches are innovative, not only in developing new molecules to treat these conditions, but innovative in how they develop non-traditional study approaches and statistical methods and clinical study endpoints. Um, in fact, uh, while most uh, traditional pharmaceuticals have about a 20% success rate from first in human to FDA approval, in the orphan drug space, it's only 13%. And as a result, there's really no one-size-fits-all approach to rare disease drug development. And it necessitates, one, both robust communication between FDA and the biotechnology industry, um, and also creativity as how we approach these uh, development programs. And it really needs to engender regulatory flexibility throughout the, uh, the process. And patients themselves play an increasingly critical role in the development of products uh, and really should be engaged throughout the, uh, the development pr uh, process to really make sure that the FDA review process is fully grounded in a balance of the benefits and risks of a potential new the therapy within the context of the available scientific evidence and as well as the severity of the, uh, of the condition and the unmet medical need. So with that, as I said before, it's very important that we fully align the economic investment uh, climate uh, with our public health need and with unmet medical need. And uh, the, um, I think what we've, uh, we've seen in the past 30 years is that public policies play a critical role in uh, doing that particularly the Orphan Drug Act of uh, 1983. Uh, two components of that, the uh, Orphan Drug Tax Credit and the Orphan Drug Exclusivity. Um, the uh, tax credit itself uh, has, um, uh, provides incentives to encourage uh, biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies development treatments uh, for rare disease and conditions by covering certain clinical development costs uh, and is designed to be very complementary to the exclusivity that is provided for uh, orphan drugs that finally reach FDA approval. And if there's one message I can make is that these incentives are working. And in the last decade, we've seen uh, enormous growth in the rare disease, and there's so much more uh, work that we need to do. As noted, we've seen almost 450 new uh, products for rare diseases, over 3,000 compounds uh, designated since 1983. There's almost an, more than 450 new uh, therapies in clinical development as we speak. And there's a great a market incentive for companies, big and large, to get involved in the space with uh, an estimate of uh, a uh, market of uh, nearly $50 billion as of uh, 2011. But more importantly, as we gain better understanding of the underlying genomics and molecular basis of these diseases, it's a very exciting time to be involved in rare disease drug development. And biotech companies are really uh, incredibly engaged and passionate about uh, speeding these new, th new therapies to market. 
So the public policies that are in place, the orphan drug credit, is so important to aligning the economics of drug development with small patient populations. And as Congress considers uh, comprehensive tax reform, I certainly hope that they will uh, bear that in mind and the great success that that tax credit has, uh, has had. But that's only as successful as we have a predictable and clear regulatory environment as well, which for particularly many small biotechnology companies is critical for attracting investment to cover the 10 years and billion dollars to bring a new therapy to market. Um, just in 2012, we saw the passage of landmark legislation, the Food and Drug Safety and Innovation Act of uh, 2012, uh, which Nord uh, hailed as one of the uh, uh, greatest uh, legislative milestones for rare disease drug development since the Orphan Drug Act, uh, to paraphrase. Um, there are a number of key provisions within that, we, which we hope will go a long way towards speeding uh, rare disease drug development. The FDA PDUFA-5 Rare Disease Program to advance policy development and staff reviewer training on uh, non-traditional approaches to drug development and education and outreach uh, to uh, industry and patients and investigators. Uh, just at the beginning of January, FDA held a major workshop on rare disease drug development. Uh, also, greater emphasis on expedited pathways for drug development, expanding the existing accelerated approval mechanism, which traditionally is focused on HIV, AIDS, and, uh, uh, and oncology, to expand that to other areas, in particular in rare diseases. Um, uh, accelerated approval, uh, unlike traditional approval, is approval based on a surrogate endpoint or an intermediate clinical endpoint that can be measured earlier in drug development, uh, which can lend itself to uh, faster clinical development times without sacrificing any of FDA's robust standards for uh, safety and, uh, and efficacy. And it's a powerful tool for expediting rare disease drug development. But there's more that we need to do to support FDA and how they implement these new provisions of uh, accelerated approval in the context of rare diseases. For example, expanding their current guidance released last summer to specifically address how rare diseases can lend themselves to the accelerated approval pathway. Uh, working with sponsors to clarify what are the evidentiary criteria needed to develop a new uh, surrogate or intermediate clinical endpoint for use under the accelerated approval uh, pathway and providing greater clarity in that process. And also meeting with sponsors earlier in drug development to discuss potential endpoints, surrogate and clinical, for rare disease uh, drug development and discussions of whether accelerated approval or traditional pr approval would be most appropriate as an approach of based on good, robust communication and a flexible regulation. Um, with respect to the breakthrough therapy designation process that was implemented also as part of uh, FIDESIA, uh, really, again, we're looking forward to, we've seen FDA embrace this program, and we would like to see it applied very successfully in the rare disease context to help to expedite clinical development uh, throughout the process and uh, minimize any potential barriers to speed these products to, uh, to market that have shown substantial evidence very early on in uh, development and substantial improvement, and also make sure that any any uh, potential barriers, whether it be clinical or manufacturing or quality, are uh, resolved quickly and uh, expeditiously to speed these breakthrough therapies to, to patients. And as I said before, the patient voice is so critically important, and we're quite encouraged to see FDA's new patient-focused drug development initiative in the uh, initial 20 disease areas that they are evaluating to better understand patient perspectives of benefit and risk and unmet medical need and disease severity. And uh, very much look forward to seeing not only how those meetings can uh, focus on rare diseases, but also how FDA continues to solicit that feedback outside of the context of those meetings. So, in conclusion, uh, it's absolutely critical, critical to promote continued alignment between, between public health priorities and areas of unmet medical need with market-based incentives, in particularly the orphan drug tax credit. Uh, promoting a flexible regulatory environment that's predictable and consistent and uh, efficient, and also incorporating patient views uh, and the views of external experts in, uh, to regulatory decisions around benefit and risk. And finally, investing in regulatory science so we can uh, uh, better speed these uh, new therapies for, uh, for rare diseases. So with that, thank you very much. Sandy, if you would join, I'm hoping that, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I thought it was really very, very important that we hear these important voices within the rare disease community. So I'd like to open it up to the audience if there are any questions. I know we don't have a, a huge amount of time, but if we run out of time, um, 
please reach out to, to me. I think a lot of you do have my email address, and I can forward that information on to other experts who might be able to answer your question for you, okay? So we'll just open it up for questions now. Yes. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank all of you and all the panelists for, for uh, putting this briefing together, because I think it, it was just a wonderful um, partnership and collaboration um, and we need to have more of those at this point in time in order to uh, make progress work. Um, I'm actually Judith Bankendorf. I'm a veteran genetic counselor. I uh, was professional staff on the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House for a while doing health, and I now work for the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Hmm. And um, we are actually um, looking at the ACA for patients with inborn errors of metabolism. Mm -hmm. And I had a question specifically uh, for Sandy um, in terms of uh, product development, and that is that the coverage for medical foods is, is an extreme patchwork quilt, as you mm -hmm. know, um, from state to state in terms of what's paid for. And I was wondering when you did the study that you quoted, whether you were only looking at um, pharmaceuticals or you included medical foods in that um, and how that data compared? I think we're on. We only included pharmaceutical <coughs> drugs in that we did not include medical foods. It's part of that. So stay tuned. Maybe a great one for series two or three. Yeah, I was going to ask if that's something. Mm -hmm. It would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Additional questions? None? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Jason? Hi, um, Jason Barron with Nord. Uh, also a question for, for Sandy. I just wanted to get better understand a little bit about the out-of-pocket uh, cost considerations for specialty pharmacy drugs. Um, so what, it, just to boil it all right down to the, the sort of common denominator, it, I just want to clarify that, that I'm understanding this correctly and for the audience as well, that uh, a family that uh, with, a, with a family member that has to re uh, rely upon a very high cost specialty tier medicine, perhaps it's physician administered in an infused situation, perhaps it might be a home infused product or, or something that might be an oral product. Um, if it is on that specialty tier and if it is in the sort of worst case high cost scenario, does that essentially amount to a cash flow problem for the family where they need to provide a very high amount of upfront cash in the first months of the year when a plan's coverage so that they can meet their deductible, meet their out-of-pocket costs, and then in that situation, once they meet the $6,350 threshold, does that then mean also that there is essentially zero cost thereafter for the rest of the plan year? Or could you, could you complete, uh, help us understand that a little bit better? Sure. Thank you. Uh, great question. And yes, I think that's the biggest concern with a large a monthly cost of the medication and a high coinsurance, as I mentioned, up to 50% in some of the silver plans is bronze as well, that that could be a huge out-of-pocket cost that hits early. Um, and I think some of the, the counterpoint to that has been, but then you spend through and your maximum out-of-pocket is done, um, but, but the, the concern is that that's all, it's kind of a flush. It happens up front within the benefit year. So how can someone realistically afford that um, without some type of assistance? Um, and then the cost, the ongoing cost remains for premiums, for example. Um, you're still going to have your monthly premium, um, but your, your out-of-pocket maximum is tied to the cost sharing. Thank you very much. Uh. Austin. So I'm Austin Bozarth, and Sandy, I have a, another question. Did your study look at the FSA accounts as part of the ACA a couple years ago? They cut them down from $5,000 to $2,500. So to your point of the upfront costs, if I had a $5,000 account, I could have used that actually all up front right off the bat. And those families who have large medical expenses for chronic diseases are getting impacted the most and having to pay for the ACA basically by this reduction in those FSA accounts, essentially. And no, we did not include that in the analysis. Thanks, Everett Crossman with PPTA. I just wanted to add, a, I'm, I'm think I'm not mistaken in saying that the out-of-pocket max doesn't apply if you are out of network, correct? So. I, you know, I think it's important to, uh, to note that as well, because as we look at access under the ACA uh, and we hear the narratives of 
of uh, constriction of network. That's incredibly important, and it hits home with the uh, out-of-pocket max as well. And of course, that means the spend through that, right? So as the patient spends through that, so it's it's a double-edged sword where that's concerned. And then with out-of-pocket providers, you may be paying 100% out-of-pocket for a provider that's out of network, and that's a real concern. To Stephanie's point earlier. Are there any additional questions? If not, we are almost right on the mark at 3.30. So I would very much like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank everyone who came here today. Thank you so very much.